Hello and a very warm welcome. My name is Guntram Wolf and I'm the director of Brügel and I'm honored and pleased today to host a debate with the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, on the topic from playing, uh, uh, from playing field to player, Europe's strategic autonomy as our generation's goal. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. President, for joining us for this debate. Um, Today, um, the plan of today's debate is first um, to hear your uh, keynote speech um, and following uh, your keynote speech, there will be time for us to engage in a debate, uh, but of course also for you in the audience to join us in this debate and ask your questions. For that, you need to go on the uh, website slido, sli.do, and type in the word autonomy autonomy and then you can ask your questions and I will see some of your questions, the questions here on my smartphone and pick some of those, not all of them, but some of those and post them to the president. Without much further ado, let me thank you again and uh, I look forward to your keynote speech. Thank you. Cher Duntram Wolf, Mesdames et Messieurs, c'est pour moi un plaisir, c'est aussi un privilège de m'adresser à vous aujourd'hui grâce à l'Institut Bruegel. Vos contributions au débat européen sont remarquées, elles ont un impact. Avoir un impact, c'est aussi le thème lorsqu'il s'agit de l'autonomie stratégique européenne. Souveraineté, puissance, nous savons que les concepts et les mots peuvent avoir des connotations différentes ici et là, mais aujourd'hui, je souhaiterais me concentrer sur la substance, même si d'emblée, je voudrais tenter d'éviter un reproche récurrent, l'autonomie, ce n'est pas le protectionnisme. C'est même l'inverse. Je vais tenter de le démontrer. Chacun, on se souvient de la formule de Paul Henry Spack qui disait il n'y a que deux types d'États en Europe, les petits et ceux qui ne savent pas encore qu'ils le sont. Petits. Et cette formule de Paul Henry Spack, elle m'inspire une autre formule. L'Europe, elle est grande. Mais elle ne le sait pas, pas encore. Et les trois dernières décennies de la construction européenne ont vu à la fois la création du marché unique, l'espace Schengen, l'euro, le grand élargissement, et enfin le traité de Lisbonne qui a consolidé notre cadre institutionnel. Chacune de ces étapes a renforcé l'Union européenne et son autonomie. Elles ont chacune de ces étapes engendré un grand marché et un espace de liberté devenu première puissance commerciale. Et avec cela, s'est développé le fameux Brussels Effect, si bien décrit dans son livre par Anou Bradford, l'effet Bruxelles. L'effet Bruxelles, ce n'est pas la bureaucratie, souvent décrite chez nous, c'est au contraire la capacité à diffuser des normes dans le monde qui force l'admiration en dehors de l'Union européenne. C'est un peu comme dans um, l'œuvre de Molière, M. Jourdain uh, parle en prose sans le savoir, Jordan et bien peut-être les Européens now, sont devenus Europeans aussi une puissance sans le savoir. A, a power, et a, a je voudrais, à titre d'exemple, euh, mentionner notre diplomatie example, climatique. Climate Nous sommes, diplomacy. comme Européens, We à l'avant-garde dans la lutte contre le réchauffement. En 2018, il n'y a pas si longtemps, quelques pays pionniers se sont engagés sur la neutralité carbone en 2050. Ensuite est venu un travail de conviction, la mobilisation de la société civile et les jeunes pour le climat. Et en décembre 2019, And in December 2019, avec l'appui du Green Deal porté par Ursula von der Leyen, les 27 États membres ont pris l'engagement de 2050 pour toute l'Union européenne et puis ensuite avec ténacité, nous avons adressé ce message à la Chine y compris lors du dernier sommet virtuel avec le président Xi. Et son annonce par le président Xi la semaine dernière à l'ONU de l'engagement chinois sur 2060 concrétise à mes yeux un succès diplomatique réel. Bien sûr, nous devons être vigilants pour la mise en œuvre, mais c'est un pas dans la bonne direction. Mesdames et messieurs, pourquoi donc le choix d'une autonomie stratégique européenne est à mes yeux encore plus essentiel 
essentiel aujourd'hui. Bien sûr, parce que le monde globalisé a beaucoup changé depuis la fin de la guerre froide, et aussi parce que un arc d'instabilité s'est développé tout autour de nous. À l'est, l'extension naturelle et inoffensive de l'espace démocratique européen a été stoppée brutalement par la Russie en Ukraine. La Russie y a perçu un danger géopolitique majeur et cela a coûté à l'Ukraine une partie de son territoire et une guerre à l'Est qui déstabilise durablement le pays et même la région. Et même si le contexte est différent, les événements récents au Bélarus mettent encore une fois en lumière le défi aux frontières orientales de l'Europe. En Méditerranée orientale, nous faisons face à des tensions et à des imprévisibilités. La Libye, la Syrie sont des foyers d'insécurité et d'instabilité. Des pressions sont exercées sur la souveraineté de la Grèce et de Chypre. Et notre relation avec la Turquie est soumise à rude épreuve. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle, vous le savez, le prochain sommet européen sera consacré à l'adoption d'une position stratégique européenne en lien avec cette région. J'ai d'ailleurs proposé l'organisation une conférence multilatérale où serait abordée les délimitations maritimes, les questions d'énergie, la sécurité, la migration, la coopération en matière économique, par exemple. Au sud de l'Europe, l'Afrique. Et concernant l'Afrique, je sens, à l'échelle de l'Europe et de ses dirigeants, combien le regard sur l'Afrique est en train de changer, change et probablement va continuer à se transformer. L'énergie la vitalité en Afrique peuvent ouvrir le chemin vers une alliance sans précédent. Cela dépend que de nous, responsables africains et européens. Et j'espère que nous aurons l'occasion de travailler intensément pour transformer cette alliance en un déploiement de projets extrêmement concrets, optimistes et positifs. À l'ouest, le Brexit, au lendemain du référendum, reconnaissons-le, le résultat a bousculé l'Union européenne. Ce choix de la souveraineté nationale a été ressenti comme un échec de la construction européenne. Et aujourd'hui, qu'en est-il À mon avis, c'est aujourd'hui le Royaume-Uni qui fait face à la force tranquille européenne. En vérité, je le crois, les Britanniques font face à un dilemme. Quel modèle de société veulent-ils pour eux-mêmes Préfèrent-ils maintenir des standards élevés de qualité, sanitaires, alimentaires, environnementaux par exemple Ou au contraire, veulent-ils une forme d'abaissement des normes qui conduira à soumettre leurs éleveurs, leurs entreprises à la concurrence probablement déloyale et injuste venant d'autres régions du monde et si je le crois profondément, la réponse à cette question-là déterminera le niveau à notre marché intérieur. Quant à l'alliance avec les États-Unis, au-delà des, des valeurs et de l'histoire qui nous s'ouvre, force est de constater une addition de choix géopolitiques contraires aux intérêts européens. L'affaiblissement du multilatéralisme, le retrait des accords de Paris, la dénonciation de l'accord sur le nucléaire iranien, la tentation protectionniste, tout cela, ce ne sont pas des détails. Bien sûr, il n'y a pas l'ombre d'un doute, nous sommes et nous voulons rester un allié solide et loyal pour les États-Unis et nous espérons que c'est réciproque. Enfin, avec la Chine, nous sommes engagés. C'est un acteur essentiel pour relever des défis globaux comme le changement climatique ou le Covid-19. Mais sur le plan économique ou sur le plan commercial, nous sommes en train, parce que c'est nécessaire, de travailler pour rééquilibrer la relation. Nous voulons plus de level playing field, nous voulons plus de réciprocité, et sur la question des droits de l'homme, nous choisissons de ne pas baisser les yeux et nous assumons la promotion de nos valeurs. Mesdames et Messieurs, ce n'est pas la prétendue faiblesse de l'Europe qui l'a placée face à des enjeux complexes. C'est bien parce que l'Europe est une puissance stratégique, l'une des premières au monde qu'elle se voit confrontée. Mais lorsque l'Europe apparaît trop faible, voire même parfois trop molle, 
Ce n'est pas nécessairement parce que d'autres étaient plus forts. C'est souvent parce que nous avons sous-estimé notre propre capacité d'influence. Enfin, l'Europe a parfois cette fâcheuse habitude, fâcheuse à mes yeux, de s'autoflageller même lorsque nous agissons de manière robuste. Et en réalité, nos débats vifs, nos confrontations visibles, apparentes, sont le passage obligé vers la décision. Et nous devons en être fiers. Nous ne sommes pas la Corée du Nord. Nous sommes un ensemble de démocraties qui parlent de débats publics européens garantissant la légitimité de nos décisions. Et cette capacité à surmonter les différences, à fixer le cap, nous l'avons démontré face au Covid-19, qui, je le crois, a créé un momentum que nous avons réussi à saisir. 1800 milliards d'euros mobilisés au départ de la décision du mois de juillet sont le carburant pour notre stratégie de résilience et de transformation aussi bien environnementale que numérique. Cette décision, je pense, restera un moment clé dans l'histoire. Nous sommes capables de nous mobiliser face à nos défis intérieurs, mais nous avons bien sûr le devoir aussi de transposer cette capacité sur le plan extérieur. Notre autonomie stratégique doit poursuivre, je pense, trois objectifs. Le premier, ça va de soi, c'est la stabilité et donc la sécurité. Le deuxième, c'est la diffusion de nos standards. Et le troisième, c'est la promotion de nos valeurs. La stabilité, c'est bien sûr la sécurité physique. C'est la paix. C'est aussi la sécurité environnementale, la qualité de l'air, l'eau potable accessible, la biodiversité protégée, le respect pour la planète et pour l'espèce humaine. Et ensuite, la sécurité économique et donc la sécurité sociale. Elle requiert un environnement favorable aux investissements et aux échanges à l'intérieur de notre marché, comme avec le reste du monde. Défendre des conditions équitables de marché et la réciprocité avec nos partenaires commerciaux, c'est une de nos priorités. Nous sommes partisans d'économies libres et ouvertes et nous sommes opposés au protectionnisme quel qu'en soit sa forme. Et l'accès à notre grand marché ne peut pas être gradé. Moins on en respecte les standards, moins on y accède. Que l'on quitte notre union ou qu'on souhaite s'en rapprocher. La sécurité économique, c'est aussi garantir notre approvisionnement en ressources critiques, en ressources stratégiques, comme par exemple, on l'a vu avec le Covid, les produits médicaux. Ou alors la question des terres rares, mais également la question des microprocesseurs, c'est essentiel pour notre souveraineté numérique. C'est un autre pan capital de notre autonomie stratégique, indispensable pour notre transformation digitale. La stabilité, c'est aussi réussir à gérer de manière ordonnée, régulière et digne nos politiques migratoires, et nous savons que cette question va beaucoup nous occuper sur le plan européen dans les prochaines semaines. Mesdames et Messieurs, notre deuxième objectif, c'est de préserver notre capacité à fixer les normes. Cette capacité, c'est un vecteur majeur de la puissance européenne actuelle. Ce sont nos normes sur l'usage des substances chimiques, qui, par exemple, assurent que les jouets fabriqués dans le monde sont sûrs. C'est notre règlement général sur la protection des données qui a fixé la norme mondiale de protection de la vie privée sur le web. Et de même, c'est notre définition et notre pression à éliminer les discours de haine qui ont poussé les grandes plateformes à commencer à éliminer cette malfaisance sur le net. Et nous voyons aussi combien le climat est le nouveau sens stratégique où l'Europe peut gagner la bataille des idées et donc gagner la bataille des normes. Comme pionniers des technologies environnementales, puis en fixant leurs standards, nous atteindrons un double résultat, prendre le leadership dans ce domaine et contribuer à la victoire contre le réchauffement.
um, fighting climate Ceci change. Illustre déjà And I think this illustrates objectif. our third objective. La force de notre modèle économique et the strength social of our economic and social model, which is based on our own shared values, quite uniquely in the world. And it's this which uh, is making us very attractive to many partners in the world. And it's this which is making us very attractive to many partners in the world. And it's this which is making us very attractive to many partners in the world. And it's this which is making us very attractive to many partners in the world. And it's this which is making us very attractive to many partners in the world. And it's this which is making us very attractive to many partners et plus which équitable, means we need to, um, être share our à l'avant-garde de la lutte contre le réchauffement climatique, and défendre to to fight des règles change, équitables de commerce, nous battre pour une fiscalité plus juste, that il y va bien sûr de notre intérêt, world, mais également interest, de l'intérêt universel. Mesdames et Messieurs, nous so, disposons d'instruments solides et nous devons probablement plus et mieux disposal, les utiliser. D'abord, il y a bien sûr les moyens financiers course, et la récente décision relative levers, au plan de relance est à cet égard essentielle. Ensuite, il y a les compétences européennes. Plan, Judicieusement uh, utilisées, uh, elles ont un impact significatif. Accords commerciaux, aides au développement, trade, gouvernance économique, supervision des marchés financiers, stratégie industrielle, numérique, spatiale, sans oublier l'euro, dont le rôle international doit être développé. Les politiques de sanctions et de visa offrent aussi une opportunité de nature régalienne que nous pouvons mobiliser. Mais soyons de bons comptes, il y a une marge possible de progrès en termes de coordination et de mise en cohérence de ces instruments au service de notre stratégie internationale. Notre haut représentant, Josep Borrell, est un super ministre des Affaires étrangères. C'est la lettre et c'est l'esprit du traité de Lisbonne. Il est totalement engagé. Son expérience, son habileté, son des atouts. Et je forme vraiment le vœu qu'en tant que vice-président de la Commission européenne et président du Conseil des Affaires étrangères, il dispose de tout l'espace politique utile au service de nos intérêts communs. Et sa tâche n'est pas facile. Parce que l'unanimité est requise en matière de politique étrangère. Et cette question de l'unanimité est, on le sait, très régulièrement débattue. Et je voudrais partager avec vous une opinion, une réflexion que je veux nuancer. Certes, l'exigence d'unanimité ralentit, parfois même empêche la prise de décision. Mais cette exigence conduit aussi à déployer des efforts politiques constant pour tenter de souder les États membres les uns aux autres, et cette unité européenne est aussi notre force. L'unanimité, par exemple, favorise l'adhésion durable des 27 pays à la stratégie délibérée ensemble. Alors, je m'interroge, le renoncement à l'unanimité ne risque-t-il pas d'apparaître comme une fausse bonne idée N'y a-t-il pas d'autres réformes plus pertinentes pour agir plus vite sur le plan international sans perdre la valeur ajoutée de notre unité Mon expérience très modeste est la suivante. Très souvent, ces derniers mois, j'ai constaté que des divergences importantes en apparence entre les États membres pouvaient rapidement être estompées grâce au débat de fond. Il en fut ainsi sur la Chine. Les préparatifs politiques nous ont permis en quelques mois de définir une position commune qui, désormais, semble être bien relayée par tous les États membres. Et je crois aussi qu'il en ira de même pour la Méditerranée orientale ou encore pour le Bélarus. J'ai bon espoir. Là aussi, nous puissions exprimer des positions communes qui puiseront leur force dans notre unité. Les décisions majeures que nous avons prises sur le budget et sur le fonds de relance illustre encore cette certitude. La confrontation politique, l'échange d'arguments sur le fond, sont une étape indispensable du processus de délibération démocratique et du fond la légitimité de la décision. Mais c'est vrai que la confiance et le respect personnel jouent aussi un rôle clé, et c'est la raison pour laquelle je tente d'encourager au maximum les interactions parfois même informelles et dans différents formats entre les dirigeants européens. L'unité n'est pas spontanée. Elle requiert effort, ténacité et une volonté sans faille et sans relâche. Mesdames et messieurs, la défense 
n'est pas une compétence européenne comme les autres. Et je connais les différentes sensibilités nationales à cet égard. À mes yeux, approfondir la défense commune est une nécessité et relève davantage du bon sens que de l'obsession idéologique. Ce projet doit se déployer au sein de l'OTAN, et c'est le sens, du partenariat stratégique entre l'Union européenne et l'OTAN, la coopération structurée et permanente et le Fonds européen de défense que nous venons de doter de 7 milliards d'euros s'inscrivent pleinement dans cette ambition et je veux saluer Jean-Claude Juncker, Frédérica Mogherini aussi, pour l'impulsion stratégique dans ce domaine n'est probablement pas encore appréciée à leur juste valeur. Mesdames et Messieurs, l'Union européenne est par essence une force positive, ouverte et tolérante. Nous savons que les échanges libres et équitables contribuent à l'essor des sociétés. Nos valeurs bienveillantes et humanistes éclairent notre ambition et notre projet de transformation. La neutralité climat et la souveraineté digitale ouvrent de nouveaux espaces pour l'intelligence humaine, l'innovation et pour le débat démocratique. Nos objectifs sont ambitieux et exigeants, la paix et la prospérité. Et c'est précisément pour cette raison que nous devons davantage déployer toutes les dimensions de notre puissance, être plus cohérents dans l'usage de nos instruments, fidèles à nos valeurs, réalistes, probablement un peu moins naïfs, et puissants au service d'un monde plus respectueux, plus vertueux et plus équitable. Just, um, souveraineté, virtuous indépendance, émancipation, quel que soit le mot, c'est la substance the world, dont il use, moins de dépendance, davantage d'influence. L'autonomie stratégique en action, c'est le credo qui nous rassemble pour définir ensemble notre destin et pour avoir un impact destiny, positif so pour le monde. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. So, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have an applause now after the speech, which we usually like like to have um, uh, when we do events in, with a, with a real audience. But now we only have an online audience, so so we look forward to getting the the applause via via various uh, uh, social media. But it was really a very inspiring speech that covered a lot of ground and. Um, uh, we have to uh, try to unpack perhaps some of the points you made. I, I, for me, I think perhaps one of the uh, most striking uh, points that you made, um, and I would like you to perhaps explain and enlarge a bit more on that point, was about the decision-making process um, in the European Council. You very much defended um, the fact that um, unanimity helps us to carry everyone along and uh, basically pull all countries uh, when all p countries pull on the same string, all together, then we are strong. Then we come with a unified position. Then we are all also together um, in uh, in the same uh, in the same boat and defend the same position. While uh, qualified majority voting, um, which of course um, has been mentioned in the State of the Union speech of uh, President uh, von der Leyen, Ursula von der Leyen, the Commission President. Um, is um, is in your views perhaps uh, not always a strength, but rather a sign of weakness. And um, I was wondering whether you could enlarge a little bit more on that point, because it is, I mean, I think one of the key questions, and many commentators, uh, many uh, think tankers would definitely think, well, at some stage, um, as we are progressing with political unity, as we have more debates among ourselves, we have to also come to a point where you know we take decisions by majority and not just by unanimity. No, no, indeed. I think there is a, an important question. It's not uh, easy to to have the the final answer, but uh, I have the impression that uh, uh, very often, if we work more together uh, before the European Council in order to try to, to prepare at a strategic level uh, our debate, it's possible with the unanimity to take uh, decisions. And of course, unanimity, it means sometimes a feeling of frustration because it means that uh, we need sometimes more time in order to be able to decide together. But I think that the unanimity is also the guarantee for all the member states uh, to be involved uh, in the process, to be involved 
in the European project. And my concern would be the following. Without unanimity, if we would decide to abandon this principle of unanimity, I don't exclude the feeling, the impression of some member states that they are not important uh, in the European process. And maybe it can, it can, uh, it can uh, uh, lead uh, to, to some negative collateral effects. I don't have a final answer. I agree that we, we need to be able to react more quickly, but maybe there are some other tools that we can try to develop in order to react more quickly. But uh, I think the, uh, the, the interesting example with China uh, the last month has demonstrated that it was possible uh, with a very strong political preparation at the highest level to uh, have a common, uh, to have a common approach, to take a common uh, decision altogether. I remember that a few months ago, probably for many observers, the, the impression was about China, uh, uh, the EU. They are divided. The member states they don't follow the same approach. And when we took the decision to go more into the substance, we observed that it was possible because we worked a lot in the preparation to to have a common approach. And now I observed, for example. Uh, uh, the last uh, the last days at the level of the General Assembly of the UN that all the member states they have expressed uh, the same approach about uh, the future relationship with China. So China, of course, a very very important topic. You already mentioned um, also in your speech um, the uh, very important summit um, a few weeks ago where you very much emphasized um, the climate issues but also the human right, uh, rights issues. And when it comes to the climate uh, issue, uh, your speech um, highlights that uh, you attribute some of the announcement that China made for its 2060 um, targets um, uh, to um, the clear EU position. So can you just uh, give us a bit more of a flavor of uh, you know what was really the debate and on the climate front, what is it really that you demanded from China? And... Uh, what was the um, the quid pro quo here? But, I mean, what was expected also from China? I mean, we all are committed to climate, to fulfilling Paris, but what what was it that we achieved really from the European Union point of view? I I, I try not to be naive. Uh, I don't underestimate how, how it will be uh, difficult in the next years to convince uh, some partners in the world and and, and China included uh, to be totally committed in order to in order to uh, to implement what we have decided in in Paris. But the fact a few days ago that China announced the decision uh, climate neutrality by 2060, it's a it's a good step in the right direction. And and who can imagine? Imagine that uh, without the role uh, of the EU, it, 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 it has been possible. It was possible for China to take uh, such a such a decision, and it's one of the it's one of the of the examples showing that we have a stronger influence than what we uh, sometimes are thinking uh, in, in Europe. And the fact that we have a clear vision for the future, uh, the European Green Deal, climate neutrality by 2050, in the next weeks, it will be a difficult debate. We will discuss the goals for 2030, very difficult and very complex debate with concrete consequences in all our member states. But the fact that we have a, a, clear, a clear vision, what we want for the future, the fact at the same time that we consider that it's possible because of uh, this uh, uh, climate change uh, challenge uh, to develop uh, innovative technologies. I think uh, that it's, it, it makes us uh, a, strong po a stronger power in the world. And with China, uh, our goal was very clear. It was important for us to convince China first that we want to engage with China and second that we want to rebalance our relationship. And we consider that it's important also uh, for, for China to be totally committed to be more committed in order uh, to, to reach uh, the goals we have, uh, uh, that we have decided in Paris. Well, let's spend a bit more time on China because it's such an important topic uh, before, before moving, moving on. Um, uh, China, um, one of the central um, aims um, for a long time has been to come uh, to an agreement on, uh, on an investment uh, relation, so uh, reaching a bilateral investment treaty. That looks very far away at this stage. Um, the German presidency wanted to seal the deal uh, during uh, during the presidency. Um, I think it has become clear that it will be very difficult. Why? Well, from a European point of view, 
uh, because uh, China um, uh, does not um, allow um, reciprocity, does not give the same degree of market access, has a very strong role of the state in the economy, which distorts competition, which makes it very difficult uh, to uh, safeguard the level playing field for European companies. Now, that was a strong point um, uh, with a uh, negotiating point of the EU for a very long time. Of course, um, now you say we are more united in our position on that, um, but still China didn't seem to move much. Um, or do, do I misinterpret this? I mean, can, where, where, how far can we push China on this point really of reciprocity and, uh, and market access? And if we can't push them, what do we do? I mean, do we uh, reduce our strategic relationship with China? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very clear that uh, we are working very hard with the Commission and also with the member states in order to to make to make progress and uh, and we we hope that it will be possible by the end of the year of this year uh, to reach an agreement uh, on the uh, investments agreement. I'm not certain that it will be the case, but we will work very hard because we think it's a it's a it's a priority. But uh, when we we prepared with the member states this uh, uh, last virtual summit with China a few a few weeks ago. We, we felt that it was very important for all the member states to be certain that uh, in case of agreement, we need to make more progress on the level of level playing field as, and, and reciprocity. And there is no, no doubt uh, we are in favor of a free economy. We are, we, we are totally, uh, totally committed and, and engaged uh, for an, an open uh, world, for, for open uh, societies. Um, but at the same time, the question is, how is it possible to make pro more progress on the level of fairness? How is it possible to have uh, fairer relationships, not only with China, but certainly with China? Well, there's many topics uh, we I, I still want to touch on, uh, but let me move perhaps to um, to uh, back to quickly to this issue of unanimity in the context of um, the neighborhood. Um, uh, you mentioned Belarus. You mentioned also um, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean um, and our difficulties to come to clear and strong positions um, as regards Bela uh, Russia, Belarus. Um, on Russia, we have uh, for quite some time um, a unanimous agreement, but on Belarus, um, the debate was is very long and very um, difficult, and some countries, I believe Cyprus, uh, still negotiate and want to have, um, you know, some... Uh, some uh, further concessions um, as regards uh, as regards the relations with Turkey. So so is unanimity perhaps not after all slowing us down too much on some issues? Well, I, I recognize that sometimes unanimity, uh, it, uh, it, it means that it takes uh, more time in order to decide. But Belarus is maybe not uh, the right example. Why? Because on Belarus, uh, immediately uh, when we, we faced uh, the difficult situation in the country after the presidential elections, uh, we had uh, a European Council in August. And by consensus, uh, we decided what will be and what would be uh, our approach related to the situation uh, in Belarus and in the region. But I recognize that uh, the last uh, days it was difficult uh, to implement what we have decided in August. Is it a problem? Yes, it's a problem. And it means that we need to work very hard. It will be the case in the perspective of the next European Council by the end of the week. And I expect and I hope that we will uh, implement what we have decided in, uh, in, in August. So you made a very strong point that we have really three strategic um, goals um, that we want to achieve with um, um, autonomy strategic, so strategic autonomy, which is in interestingly, by the way, the expression, it was first sovereignty, now it's autonomy. It's an interesting change in, in the word, and perhaps you want to say a word on that, because um, the German finance minister, for example, continues to use the word sovereignty, um, uh, you use autonomy, uh, which I, I think has a quite a different connotation than, than sovereignty. Um, but uh, so, so perhaps you want to say one word on this uh, um, this uh, linguistic difference. Um, but but then I, uh, you you really highlight three points: stability, um, diffusion of our promotion of our standards, and promotion of our values. And I was wondering if you would rank those three. Where are we most successful of those three and where are we least successful? Are we most successful in stability, most successful in standards 
or most successful in uh, promoting our values? Well, I, I, I will try to be very, very uh, uh, transparent. My impression is that uh, we are we are very good when we, we we work in order to promote our standards, and we we made a lot of progress the last years, and we need to improve our capacity to have uh, to have more influence and to be more efficient uh, when when uh, we promote our values and when we, we we are working very hard in order to to have more stability. Uh, is it easy? Not. No, it's not uh, easy. It's a, it's a difficult it's a difficult challenge. And maybe w one word about uh, the, the, the autonomy, sovereignty. Um, I would like to, to repeat that uh, I understand very well uh, that the meanings uh, of the the words uh, can be different in the different European countries. It's very important when we we start uh, this important political debate that uh, we we. Have avoid having misunderstandings between us. That's why, that's why it was very important for me to focus more on the substance uh, and, and to be less obsessed by the question of, uh, of the words that we, that we use. In any case, my impression is that we need, and we all agree on that, we need to work very hard in the future in order to, to be less dependent and to develop strong, open international relationships but with more fairness in comparison with the current situation. So when we talk about the issue of stability, um, you mentioned um, uh, security as one dimension, and you mentioned uh, very prominently um, supply chains, uh, medical production, rare earth, um, microprocessors, and reducing our dependency on, on others. Um, at the same time, you started off your speech saying autonomy is not protectionism. And um, I think this is, of course, a very, very difficult debate. And um, one of the first things I get asked whenever people ask me about the topic sovereignty or autonomy, they ask me, well, but doesn't that mean um, basically protectionism? Doesn't it mean we need to? you want to protect your own industry at the expense of foreign uh, industries? And let's just take the example of medical supply. Um, uh, Europe is one of the world's leaders um, in uh, in medical um, exports. Um, we export more uh, high-tech medical goods than we import. Um, still, we we are having a debate about um, reducing our import dependency, which could be a very risky strategy because our exports might actually suffer and we might actually um, be confronted with protectionism. Uh, from others who reply to us, well, you protect, you don't want to import any more our, I don't know, medication, our um, uh, face masks, so we don't import your um, high-tech high -tech export goods. So, so is that really the right um, approach, and how do we make sure it be doesn't become a protection? I, I listen. I listen carefully to this observation, and and indeed, uh, it would be a, a big mistake uh, if we would uh, 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 open the way for more protectionism. It's exactly uh, the, the contrary. We we, we need uh, an open economy, uh, no hesitation, no no doubt on that. But today, what's the current situation in many in many fields? We open our big. Uh, single market uh, for many companies coming from abroad, not necessarily the same standards in comparison with our uh, businesses, with our uh, companies. Uh, we discussed a few minutes ago about the situation with China. It's a very good example. When I meet uh, uh, European businesses, uh, uh, they, they, they tell us a lot, many uh, uh, experiences, concrete experiences, uh, which demonstrates uh, that the situation is not, uh, not, not fair. Uh, uh, and indeed, I think that uh, we need, uh, between the member states, a very uh, serious debate on that in order to avoid uh, making the mistake of protectionism. It's certainly it would be it would be it would be uh, crazy uh, from the European uh, perspective. But at the same time. I think we need to, to rebalance our relationships, especially at the trade level with uh, some regions in the world. You mentioned trade, so we have a question from the audience um, exactly about the qu uh, about trade. Um, um, the person is asking was, how do you see open strategic autonomy developing in the area of trade? What would you emphasize in the phrase open strategic or autonomy? The, the three the three words. <laughs> if we keep if we keep this expression, uh, the, the three words would be important, of course. Right, all all three words are important. Um, 
um, so um, so let's let's uh, still think a little bit more about about the trade issue. I mean, the one of the key uh, and strong competences that the EU has is of course trade policy because. Um, we have a commissioner dedicated to it, and the commissioner can actually do trade deals not just on based on unanimity, but also based on on QMV. Um, how do you see our trade relation uh, with major trading partners, especially the United States, um, developing um, in the coming years? First of all, I think that we, we, we need to continue uh, to be very committed uh, in order to try to reform uh, the, the World Trade Organization. And we are working with uh, uh, important uh, partners uh, like Japan, for example, but also with, uh, with others in order to try to make some progress. But at the same time, we, we, we know that uh, uh, after uh, the elections in the United States, we suppose that uh, it will be possible uh, to, 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 to have uh, a strong channel of dialogue with the United States in order to, to tackle those important topics. My observation is very pragmatic. I observed uh, the last uh, the last months, the last years, uh, a choice uh, in the United States uh, regarding this trade issue, which was not always very friendly towards uh, the European uh, Union. Uh, I hope we will develop uh, a good, a positive channel of dialogue, channel of communication, channel of negotiations. We, we made we made some small progress uh, the last weeks, uh, but of course it's important to, to, to develop a, a, a broader vision in order to see how is it possible to, to have a good, a strong, a sustainable relationship, also trade relationship with the United States, important ally uh, for, for us. But we, we observed uh, that uh, uh, with uh, this new approach in the United States, uh, America first, uh, it means that it's also important for us not to choose to a, a kind of protectionism, but it's important for us to defend our interests and to promote our values. And you, you, you see uh, that uh, the European standards are most of the time higher standards in comparison with uh, other regions in the world. Well, uh, the United States an important ally, um, China um, a partner with, with whom to engage. Uh, but where do we stand in the conflict between China and the United States? Because irrespective of the next president, uh, who is going to be the next president in the United States, um, the course um, that the United States has taken on China, the much tougher line, be it on technology, uh, be it on uh, uh, um, yeah, market access issues, be it on many, many issues, I think that line um, will remain. I mean, the United States will have a very tough line. So what, what will we do as Europeans? Will we have to choose? Will we develop our own line? How, how will it go in my opinion, it's clear that it's, uh, it would be not acceptable for us to, to, to become a collateral victim of this conflict between China and, uh, and the United States. That's why we need to, to identify what's our own path, what's our own way. And that's what we, we did uh, during the last uh, virtual summit with uh, China, which explained Point one, we want to engage with China because China is an important actor in order to tackle climate change, to face the consequences of COVID-19, uh, to develop uh, an approach more based on, uh, on, on multilateralism, for example. On the other hand, on trade, uh, I repeat that it's important for us to rebalance our relationship for more, for more fairness, uh, for more reciprocity, for more uh, level playing field. And um, I think it would be it would be a, uh, it, it would be a, a mistake if we would accept uh, as European Union just uh, to, to to follow uh, the approach proposed by the United States. I don't want to decouple uh, uh, with China or from China. We think that uh, it's important to remain uh, uh, engaged with them. It's, that's what we will do. Well, I don't want to decouple from, from China, but um, the US, of course, may or may not, uh, but they may um, push push us in that direction. And as they do, um, it might become actually very, very difficult for the European Union uh, to preserve its own line. And let's just take one example. I mean, we've we've had this con these conversations in the context of Iran and the Iran sanctions where the United States was uh, threatening and was imposing secondary sanctions on, on European firms. 
um, the United States is starting to think about these issues uh, and to act in some spaces in the technology space when it comes to, t to China. Um, so, for example, technological companies that get targeted um, by, um, by U.S. authorities and, you know, business with those technology companies is uh, getting increasingly difficult. So what are the counter instruments or what are the... The, what is the scope for us really to avoid being pushed in that direction? I think that uh, we, 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 we need to, to, to develop our own, own strategy because we have our own goals. Take, for example, the digital agenda. Uh, for us, because, our, 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 because of our fundamental values, it's important that we develop a very strong ambition related to, related to the digital agenda, taking into consideration the privacy, uh, the freedoms, which, in my opinion, is an added an edit, um, value. And that's why we need to promote with China, with the United States, with other regions of the world, our European, our European uh, approach, point one. And point two, it's not possible for me to predict what will happen uh, in the United States after the next uh, uh, elections in this uh, country. But in any case, I hope after the elections in the United States, uh, that we will have a good, a strong uh, debate uh, with the American authorities uh, in order to, to work more uh, together at the international level. I just observed uh, the last uh, months, the last years, that it was not so easy for the EU uh, to keep a permanent channel of dialogue, of negotiation uh, with our very important uh, ally, the United States. We will see what will be possible, but in any case, we consider as uh, EU uh, that uh, we need to follow this, uh, uh, this approach with China that we have uh, developed together, which is clear. This is a clear choice. We uh, uh, have our European values. We promote our values. We don't hesitate to tackle this question of Hong Kong, uh, the, uh, the way the, the, the minorities are, are not respected uh, in, in some uh, regions in, in, in China. And we don't hesitate to explain to the Chinese authorities that we are ready to continue to engage with them uh, at the trade level, for example, but that it's important for us to rebalance this relationship. And I hope that in the next months, by the end of the year, I hope, I'm not certain, but I hope that it will be possible to deliver. And why is it important to be clear and to be united? Because for China, if we are clear, if we speak with a clear voice, and if we are united, then we are in a better position in order to defend our uh, common interests. So would we be ready to use our you know, uh, unity um, to defend some of our values in a strong way, for example, when it comes to uh, minority rights in China? Uh, I give one example. I was very clear during this uh, virtual summit, and we explained it for us, it was very important uh, to, to, to send uh, European teams or even uh, UN uh, teams uh, in the regions in order to have a political dialogue about, uh, about the different topics, uh, human rights included. Um, this message is a very clear uh, uh, message, and I think that we, we need to be proud of uh, our uh, European values. Uh, last week, we we had the General Assembly, the, the virtual General Assembly of, uh, of the UN, but also the values uh, of the UN are based on the dignity, uh, are based on the human rights, uh, and that's why we, we promote uh, this approach. So one person um, here on, on Slido, and please join us on Slido for more questions, is asking the question about the international role of the euro. Um, there was a big push in back in 2018-19 um, to promote the international role of the euro. That was in the wake of um, Iran, uh, very much um, in the wake of pressure um, uh, on financial and monetary institutions to engage in any business with Iran, which in the end undermined our ability really to um, continue um, doing business and uh, fulfilling our part of the deal with um, with Iran. Um, that sort of discussion has quieted down a little bit. You mentioned it in your speech now um, quite prominently again. Um, we have, of course, created a major safe asset, or we are about to create it um, with the EU bonds in the in the next generation EU. But how do you see this going forward, and how strongly do you want to promote the international role of the euro? V very 
quickly after my appointment, uh, I made this statement because I think indeed after the experience uh, related to the situation in Iran and the American decision uh, regarding the GCPOA, it was the clear demonstration that we need to strengthen the international role of, uh, of uh, the euro. Uh, and what we have decided in July, this is uh, certainly a very strong step uh, in order to make uh, this eurozone very strong, very, very credible. This is a strong signal uh, that we send to the rest of the of the world, point one. But of course, we need to continue to work. It's not easy on some other important topics like uh, the the banking union, like the capital markets union, uh, and uh, with the new president of the eurozone, we will work very closely in order to prepare the next uh, euro summit at the level of uh, uh, the European Council. But there are also some interesting topics that maybe we need to tackle in the in the future. The fact that uh, uh, the the the, the the, 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 the tools, the, the payment tools, the payment means uh, are located outside of, uh, of Europe. Maybe we need also to think about the, 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 the possibility as EU to, to develop uh, our, uh, our own stronger uh, strategy uh, on this topic. Let's talk a bit about uh, about Russia. Um, we have a question from uh, from uh, uh, someone in the audience um, who's, who argues that the EU is fully dependent on importing natural gas and oil from Russia, which is politically used by Moscow. What is the EU doing to uh, to end this unhealthy connection? Yes, uh, I recognize that uh, the relationship with, uh, with, with Russia is, uh, is difficult, is sensitive, and there are different sensitivities in, in, in Europe. Uh, and, and certainly we have different topics uh, related to the relationship with, uh, with Russia. Energy is an important topic, but also uh, security. Uh, what about the economic uh, development? Uh, we, we know that uh, we have decided uh, 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 sanctions against, uh, against uh, Russia. Um, I intend, uh, like we did for China, like we are doing uh, for the East Mediterranean, I intend in the next months to open a strategic debate at the level of the European Council uh, on, uh, on Russia, because I think indeed that uh, it will be important to have a common vision, to have a common goals uh, to uh, be very, very clear, and we are very clear, uh, we need to be respected. All our member states in Europe need uh, to be to be uh, respected, and we will not avoid having in the next months uh, a serious debate on the future of uh, our relationship with this part of the world. So should we, uh, should we end Nord Stream 2? You, you, you know that um, this uh, no stream two question is very controversial uh, in Europe. It's not a, it's not a, a surprise, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think that at the level of the European Council, it's uh, it's possible to, to discuss the different uh, uh, difficult questions between us. And when uh, it comes to to Russia, I suppose that some member states will tackle this uh, topic as well. So, uh, so, so, the, so there are many questions in different directions coming here in uh, in in uh, in our feed. So please uh, join the feed if you have a last question. We, I can ask one or two more questions. Um, but I really see two two more questions that I find stand out. Um, uh, one is on this, and since you mentioned the Euro Summit and the promotion of the international role of the Euro. Uh, is the question of a sort of eurozone or EU finance minister, and um, uh, someone wants to hear what uh, in the audience wants to hear whether we should reopen that debate or whether that debate has already been settled, and the EU finance minister as our commissioner uh, uh, for 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 budget, um, or how do you see that that position going forward? Well, I have the impression that uh, with uh, with a good and a strong cooperation between the Commission uh, and uh, the president of uh, the euro the euro group uh, it's possible to make to make progress and i have the impression that the priori the, the priority uh, in the next month should be uh, the banking union and the capital market union i think it's very it's very concrete and it would have more effect i think uh, that uh, the possible appointment of uh, uh, one more european personality 
Okay, so so perhaps the last question I really want to ask is about, um, since we discussed also trade issues quite a lot, is about the thorny and very important issue of bar carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is asked here by, by a person in the audience. Um, uh, he or she wants to hear what's your view on the impact on developing countries. Um, Perhaps what I would would add is um, what what is your view also on this mechanism with the United States? Um, it seems to me that um, the Biden, a possible Biden president, um, has already made strong statements about um, climate policy and about being a priority, and about of course also the need to have some sort of an external adjustment uh, mechanism, carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, would that be a transatlantic agenda also to really work on carbon border adjustment and a transatlantic trade relation together with the United States, have a joint? I, I think this is a, this is a, a, a very essential uh, debate uh, that we will have in the next uh, months, in the next years. This is also a difficult debate because we, we know that there are many legal concerns, especially uh, the possibility for uh, the World Trade Organization to uh, to consider that uh, that it would be in line with uh, with uh, with uh, the regulation, the international regulation. Um, and I know also uh, when it comes uh, uh, to the economic sectors uh, in uh, Europe that there are different opinions on that because uh, the devil uh, can be uh, in the details and uh, based on the possible modalities, uh, this good idea uh, can be efficient or not really efficient and can be also counterprodu counterproductive. But at the same time, I am personally convinced that we need to make progress on this topic with the European Parliament, with the Council, with the Commission. Uh, we will see what will be the proposals that the Commission will put on the table on that. It will be an interesting basis indeed uh, in order to, to nourish the political dialogue with our ally in the United States, but also with uh, other regions in the world, other countries in the world, like China, like China, for example. But I would like to be clear, uh, the carbon uh, measure adjustment uh, should be uh, in link with our ETS system. And we need to tackle at the same time, in parallel, this possible reform with an improvement of our ETS system. And our ETS system can also be a, a, a basis, uh, an inspiration uh, for other regions in the world, for other countries in the world, in order to, to implement such a strategy, in order to be certain that we make progress uh, regarding the, the question of climate change. Uh, and I uh, can imagine that with China, for example, in the future, it can, or with India in the future, it can be uh, a very uh, interesting and important topic that we need to tackle together. Well, indeed, um, the emission trading system is at the core of the European efforts for climate change and is a big topic um, uh, uh, also in, in, in many other countries. Since you mentioned India, if you allow me one last uh, short question on, on India, um, because we have, we've discussed Russia, we've discussed the United States, we've discussed China, we've discussed the neighborhood, but we haven't discussed um, um, India and our strategic approach uh, to, to India. Can you, can you say just one yeah, word? I, 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 I consider that India is a very important partner for many, many uh, reasons in this part of the world. That's why we'll have a summit next year with, uh, with India. It was important for me uh, not only to be engaged with China, but it was important for me also to give a clear signal that uh, India is an important partner in many in many fields. We are working uh, in preparation of, uh, of this uh, summit, and I'm uh, confident, I have the impression, especially at the level of the digital agenda and the creation of, uh, of the data, that we have many, many topics uh, that we need to discuss with China in order to try to develop more common approach uh, with this uh, with this country, which will play, for obvious reasons, also for demographic reasons, a very important role in the next decade. Mr. President, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you so much uh, for this very fruitful debate and the great uh, exchange of ideas. Um, I think it was a pleasure and our audience was very engaged. So thank you very much for thank you. joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you.